Good morning. Let's get started. Let's sing at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride. I carried not my Lord was crucified. No. And so we've got the best folks in the world working on it right here, I promise you. So, but we'll, we're taping everything, so we'll get it online here in just a little bit, okay? So uh, it'll be on, so folks that ask you, what happened to the service? Say, it'll be on, it'll be on the internet here just a little bit later on, okay? Uh, but great, we, we have a great day today. It's uh, leaving a legacy Sunday. I'm so grateful for uh, everything that God has done in this place. And uh, we had some pretty bad weather last night. I hope all of you are doing well and that you didn't get hit by the tornadoes that were around. So uh, God is good. All right, I'm going to pray for us this morning. And uh, we, I've got a busy week this week. So uh, pray for pastor this week uh, and uh, other things. It got just some, <laughs> uh, broke a tooth. And so it's now it's got to come out. So. So y'all pray for me, <laughs> okay, and pray for the people too, so, in <laughs> uh, uh, different things. So uh, let's go to the Lord and just thank him for all his goodness. Let's continue to pray for our country, the election's coming up, and uh, I'm just looking forward. Man, I, I, I have to tell you, last week was just, had to be one of the top five services last week, and every service we've ever had at Woodlake, what a blessing last week was, and so very grateful for all of those things. So we had Sunday school started this morning. Uh, Brother Carroll began to teach again. And uh, so if you're in Carroll's class, amen, and you want to come back in there, they're meeting in the fellowship hall. Uh, so you can spread out in there if you want to. Sanford's class has been going on. You could, could come in there. And then uh, others are doing it online. So I'm very grateful for that. So uh, we are just trying to get nursery preschool, everything straightened out so we can have a place for everybody, the kids' ministry, all of those things. So we're, we're easing back into it. Uh, we didn't do too much of easing this morning. It was full bore. So, uh, <laughs> but we're working the kinks out of everything, and I'm grateful. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. I uh, just, just have a burning message on my heart for you today. Amen? All right, Lord Jesus, thank you for this day, and thank you for... Uh, Lord, at the time of the offering, as we come not only to give our offering that we give to leaving the legacy fund, that that fund itself will help us to continue to pay our bill, but also to get this building paid off so that we can do greater ministry. I'm grateful for the privilege of being in your house. There are so many across this country who are not able to be together today. And so, uh, Lord, for, for whatever reason, because they have... Uh, governors that shut their cities down and their counties down and Lord I'm grateful for our governor who is not interfering with us uh, worshiping our God and so Lord we do uh, never never would we 
uh, encroach upon you or your wisdom or your guidance or your sovereignty. We want to be careful. Uh, we, we don't want to be foolish. We want to be the people of God obeying our Heavenly Father. And so as we come, help us as we are careful, but as we come and worship you because you are the only way that this virus and other problems in our world will be solved. And so we ask you to, to walk with us, Lord, to care for us, but most of all, to use us for your glory. And I pray that you get glory in everything that we say and do. And may Wood Lake Baptist Church be the light of Christ in this community. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray today. Amen. Let's stand and sing, For God So Loved. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find His mercy. Come all you sinners, come find His mercy, come to the table He will satisfy. Of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that he gave us. Fullness of God. 
says, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Let's sing that again. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Sing amen. Children and their children and their children, may his favor be upon you and a thousand 
generation and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going and your weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for Sing you amen. Amen, 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 amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make His face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. Let's sing that again. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make His face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Lord, thank you for this day that you've given us, the peace that you've given us, to know that you died on that cross for us, that we don't have to worry, that if we believe in you, that we know where we're going to go, that we're going to come and praise you for eternity, God. Thank you for all your many blessings that you've given us, all the miracles you've provided. Lord, this book, it may be old, but you're not through yet. You're not through writing stories. You're not done with your miracles yet. Lord, Amen. What a precious word. Lord, I thank you for everything that you've done for us, everything you've provided for us. I pray for those that don't know your name this morning, that they come to find you, Lord. I pray for Brother Jerry as he brings the message this morning, that we open our hearts and go out and disciple to others. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Michael, thank you so much. I'll find Mark chapter 15. And, and I hope that you're noticing um, one of the things that has happened over the last two or three weeks and maybe even several months is God's Spirit in our worship service has just been very sweet. And the Lord is speaking to us. And I want you to know something. What you just did there, what you just sang was the Word of God. You sang His Word back to Him. That song was the priestly prayer. And... Uh, God told Moses, tell the people, uh, tell the priests, tell Aaron uh, to tell he and his sons, pray this prayer over the people. May the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. May he turn his face towards you and be gracious unto you. That's the word of God, man. It doesn't get any better than that. We sing his word back to him. Awesome. So the, the word has been sweet. And I, I want to talk to you today. If Lane, if we have a... Or a uh, Emily, we have a, a slide up there, Jesus the Redeemer, and uh, we're talking about the crucifixion of the Lamb. And uh, Jesus the Redeemer, you'll remember where we have actually been, and I didn't know this until this morning, but my, my pointer won't work on the television, so, <laughs> so use your imagination. So, But here's where we are in the red there, the, the Redeemer has been tried, and then now we're going to number five, the Redeemer is crucified. And so we're moving our way through this second part of the book of Mark. Jesus has presented himself, the Redeemer he teaches, the Redeemer prepares to die. We went through the trials last week, and then this week is number five, the Redeemer is crucified. And then we'll, I'll have another slide for you here in just a moment. But uh, we're in this section of Scripture here in Mark chapter 15. If you'll look in verse number 22 with me, let me read the text for you. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. 
And then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it. And they crucified him, divided his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And they crucified two robbers with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So... You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. And in the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, they mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And those crucified with him also hurled insults on him. And at the sixth hour darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a spun with wine vinegar, they put it on a stick and they offered it to Jesus to drink and now leaving him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. They said, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. There were some women there watching from a distance. Among them, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, the younger, and Joseph and Salome in Galilee. These women had followed him and cared for his needs. They ministered unto him. And many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Now, if a man were to take upon the task of writing about the end of the Lord Jesus' life, it might take a lifetime to write all the things that took place there. If a professional journalist were to uh, teach us or write about and produce some article or information about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it might go on for eternity, and it has. But I am so amazed at the simplicity of what the gospel writers give us. No human being could actually say so much in such a very small space. The choices of the events that the Holy Spirit gives us are magnified because this is an inspired scripture. They crucified him, they divided his clothes by lot in fulfillment of what the scriptures said. Everything that Jesus owned or everything that Jesus had, even his life, was taken from him. This is the third hour. The first hour is 6 a.m. in the morning, the beginning of the day. And so we've moved on to 9 a.m. in the morning. Jesus, you'll remember, as I preached about the trials, has been run all over the place. He's been beaten. He's been dragged everywhere. He's been spit upon. He's been hit in the head. He has a crown of thorns on. He, he's been beaten almost to a pulp. He is dehydrated. He is without blood. He has carried his cross and collapsed, and, and, and now they're taking him to Golgotha. The scriptures were fulfilled that he would be crucified with transgressors. Jesus was killed and crucified with transgressors. I hope to be able to preach this before we leave Mark and leave this section. But on that hillside that day, there were three people there. There was a man who died in his sins. He hurled insults at the Lord Jesus Christ and made fun of him. And that man died in his sins. There was another man that died to his sin. There was a man there that day that after, after even hurling insults at Jesus, at some point came to his senses and he saw and his heart softened and he died to his sins. And he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. But there was one more man there that day and he died for sin. 
and Jesus Christ, the tenderness of the Spirit that's been in our sanctuary this morning, I want you to even pray in your heart right now and let God help you to feel and to understand the beauty of what actually happened. The Word tells us that the very people that were there uh, hurling insults at Him, Jesus actually was there to save them. That's just completely the depraved nature of man on display. Why would you curse the person that's trying to save you? The man that is literally in the process of helping you and dying for you. And what do the people do? They say, oh, if he'll come down from the cross, we will see and we will believe. Can I say to you that miracles never save anyone? As a matter of fact, people that have to have miracles uh, to believe are generally the people that will never believe. The Bible here tells us and shows us the beauty of the greatest miracle that anyone could ever perform. What Christ did on the cross that day, when you look at the theological statements and teachings behind the crucifixion of Jesus, we just completely stand in awe of what God has done. How in the world could you hurl insults at the one and ask for a miracle when the greatest miracle in all of history was being performed right there before them? That they little did they know that if the Jesus had actually come down from the cross, we all would have been doomed. In verse 33, it tells us that from uh, three hours from noon, now we're at the noon hour, to three, darkness came over the earth. Well, I want to say to you that I believe exactly what that says, that somehow, some way, some cosmic event that cannot be ignored, that from that three-hour period of time, there was darkness. And I mean, I don't think it just got a little bit dark like there was a storm. I believe it got really dark. And God was making a statement. We do know that when Jesus came into this world, uh, the Scripture tells us at His birth there was a lot of light. There was a lot of singing. There was a lot of praise. But at His death, there actually was darkness. It was, it was the hatred of mankind. In, thir in verse 34, it is quite strange that there's a statement there. It's enigmatic at the, at the least. It is unbelievable uh, that there is this full mystery and it, this statement that is so very difficult to understand. Through the life of David, uh, King David, the one who was a type of Christ in the Old Testament, it's recorded in Psalm 22 in verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me? Well, why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my, of my groaning. David prefigures and shadows what is going to happen to the Lord Jesus. This is the only time in all of the Scripture that Jesus did not refer to God as his Father. And he cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. I call this the divine separation. I don't know if that term is original with me. I had it in my notes in another sermon. Uh, but nonetheless, whether I borrowed it or whether it's mine, the truth is that this, enig uh, uh, this enigmatic statement, this very difficult statement to understand, it really can be described as a divine separation. I, I don't really understand it. I I'll be honest with you, I'm not holy enough to understand how Jesus could be separated from the Father. Was the Trinity actually divided? At some point, at some time in all of this, we have to know and we have to understand. Even as hard as this is to, to understand and to explain, we don't understand how far the separation went. It's hard to imagine this, but at somehow, some way, God forsook the Son. You say, Brother Jerry, that is just unbelievable. How could that happen? Can I say to you that if God had not turned from His Son, He would have had to turn from you. This speaks of really the substitutionary atonement. It, 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 I, I do know that the theology of all this speaks of the atonement. This was the substitutionary aspects of the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ experienced a horrible separation from the Father. It is my personal opinion... Uh, that in the, in the garden when Jesus was praying and he was, and he was weeping and he was crying and he was, he was saying to the Father, let this cup pass from me. I do believe that Jesus was willingly wanting to go to the cross. But as he was in agony there, I think the agony came in not even as much to die for the sins of the people, but because he knew he would be separated from the Father. I don't understand that. Luther... Martin Luther actually went into seclusion. 
Luther said, I'm going into seclusion, I'm going to take this passage, and I'm going to try to understand it. And he began to study the Scripture, and he went away, and he was by himself for so long, and, and he recorded himself saying that when I came out of seclusion, I was more confused than when I went in. I love what John MacArthur says here. Let me quote. In some way and by some means, in the secrets of divine sovereignty and omnipotence, the God-man was separated from God for a brief time at Calvary as the furious wrath of the Father was poured out on the sinless Son who in matchless grace became sin for those who believe in Him. I want to say to you that Jesus Christ was separated from the Father so that you and I, through His substitutionary atonement, would never be separated from God. We as unbelievers, those who die, listen to me, those who die in their sin will be eternally separated from God. But you and I, because Christ was separated from God, took that punishment for you and for me. Habakkuk 1.13 says, Your eyes, O Lord, are, are too pure to look upon evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, listen, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The reason that there was separation, the reason that the father had to turn his back on his son is because uh, uh, for you and for me, for the love of Christ, it was done for us. I love the way the ESV translates this. And I've actually looked at the text to make sure it wasn't an addition to smooth out the text. These words are actually there. 2 Corinthians 5.21 in the ESV reads like this. For your sakes, for our sake. I like it that they start the sentence that way. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. When Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was for you and it was for me. We need to understand the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. It was for you and for me. How can human beings in these days come before the Father with empty hearts, dry eyes, and no compassion, no joy, no excitement. John literally says in John 19 and verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. This begs the question for me, what was finished? The Greek word is tetelestai. And koine Greek, the, the Greek that your pastor learned in seminary, is koine. It's the koine Greek. The word koine means gutter. It means common. It was the common language of the day. It was the business language of the day. And so you would go in and you would buy some products and you would put it on a tab. And then you would begin to pay that tab off just like we do today. How many of y'all remember layaway? Y'all remember that? And uh, we have a different thing called layaway now. It's called MasterCard. <laughs> and when it's, when it's done, they send you a statement that has a zero balance on it. But in this day, you would go in and you'd pay that last little payment, and the, and the owner of the shop would write across it, tetelestai. It means finished. It means complete. It's over. It's done with. The bill has actually been paid. And so uh, I want to say to you that when Jesus Christ hung on the cross and died for you and me, and he said, tetelestai, it is finished. And so what do we know that is finished? Well, I want to say to you what was finished was God's complete and total will was finished. Jesus came when he was asked where he was. He said, I've been about my father's business. He was doing the work that God called him to do. And I want to say to you that I have failed the Lord so many times in the will that God has for my life. I've gone in too many different directions I've been turned around, I've sinned, I've missed the mark of God so many times. Jesus Christ never missed the will of God. Hallelujah. All of the Old Testament prophecy concerning the life of Jesus was fulfilled right down to the very prophetical minutia. Very simply, right down to the place where someone put literally a sponge on a stick and held it up to the Lord to drink from it 
was a prophecy that was fulfilled. Uh, Psalm 69, 21, they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. In Psalm 31, 5, into your hands I commit my spirit. I have re- you have redeemed me, O Lord. You've, you are my faithful God. Sin was atoned for. That's what was finished. Jesus allows us access to God. He gives us forgiveness. So all of the will of God was completed for you and for me. That there was an atonement that took place. L- listen to me. First John 2, 2. Oh, he is the atoning sacrifice, not only for our sins, but the sins of the world. Did you hear what I just said? Oh, I've got friends that like to fight me about this passage, but I want to tell you something. The atonement of Jesus Christ was for all men. Not some men, all men. The, the atonement is sufficient for all men. It will be efficient for those who come to know Jesus Christ. But it's for, efficient for all. And they say, oh, you can't prove that. And I say, oh, yes, I can. It's right here in the Word. He is the atoning sacrifice, not only for our sins, speaking of Christians, but sins of, for the sins of the world. Don't hang your hat on some man's theology. Don't put all your theological eggs in one man's theological basket. Trust the Word of God. Let the Word speak. Uh, The wrath of God was removed. But Jerry, what do you mean? Well, there's two theological terms you need to understand. Expiation and propitiation. Expiation and propitiation. The atonement allows you not only to be forgiven for your sins, but the wrath of God is removed. If you Listen, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no class condemnation. You say, Brother Jerry, when you're lost, does that mean God's mad at you? No, but you abide upon the wrath of God. If you're without Jesus Christ today, you are under the wrath of God. But as soon as you receive the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross, you are freed from the wrath. Why, Brother Jerry? Because Jesus was punished for you. The wrath of God was poured out on the Lord Jesus Christ because your sins had to be paid for. The ceremonial, the civil, and the moral law was fulfilled. When Jesus said, tetelestai, it is finished, he was saying, I've kept the civil law, the moral law, and the ceremonial law. He says, I've done everything. The penalty of sin was paid. Jesus was punished for us. Death was defeated. Listen to me. One of my favorite uh, word studies has been on the little word once for all. And it's three words in the English, but it's one word in the Greek. It's, the, the, it's a little Greek word, hapax. And hapax means once for all. Now listen how important this is in the theology that comes from this. Romans 6.10. Sanford likes Romans, don't you, buddy? The death he died, he died once for all. Hapax. But the life he lives, he lives to God. He died once for all. There was a sacrifice. I'm about to have a spell. Y'all all all right? He died one time, and that was it. There's no other Messiah coming. That was it. He's the Messiah. He died once for all. Hebrews 7, 27. Unlike the other high priest, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day for his first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for the sins once for all, hapax, when he offered himself. Once for all. That's it. Hebrews 9, 26. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared, hapax, once for all, at the end of the age to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Sin done away with. One sacrifice finished. Even in 1 Peter, Peter says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. The separation has been removed. Tetelestai. It is finished. I have already talked about this, but let me dig into this just a little bit more. This is the substitutionary atonement. Jesus took your place and my place. And I want to apply this to a few passages that may have been a little difficult for you in the past, but to help you understand the substitutionary work theologically. In Romans chapter 6, in verse 6 and 7, it says this, 
Listen very carefully. For we know that our old self was crucified. Your old self was crucified. Has anybody in here been on a cross? Anybody been on a cross? Nobody. Then how were you crucified on the cross? See, somebody had to do it for you. That substitution. You hear me? Y'all with me? For we know that our old self was crucified, substitution, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Substitution. Because anyone who has died has been freed from the sin. Romans 6, 11. In the same way, count or reckon, substitution, yourself dead to sin. Brother Jerry, how could I be dead to sin? Because your master, your Lord, died for sin for you. Substitution. Y'all getting me? Romans 6, 14. Listen. <laughs> I'm setting you up. Y'all know that, right? So just hang in there with me. Let me give you all of it. For sin shall not be your master. Substitution. You see, you changed, you changed masters. You changed lords. Because you're not under the law, but you're under grace. You see, Jesus beat sin. He beat death. He beat hell. He beat the grave. He took your place. He substituted himself in your place. So you see, if I were to say this, now listen, if I were to say, how many of y'all going to die? When you die, you're going in the grave, you're going to stay there. Everybody, everybody with me? No, you're not going to go for that, are you? How many of y'all believe in the resurrection as Christians? Okay. If you believe in the resurrection, the reason you believe in the resurrection is because Jesus beat death for you. All right, well, the Bible says that Jesus also beat sin for you. Uh-oh. Y'all catching what I'm saying? <laughs> See, tetelestai means, listen, there's no more obligation to sin. The bill has been paid. See, if you're saved and you keep going back to sin, it would be like me today as your pastor, 35 years removed from working at Hardy's, in Augusta, Georgia, if I just went in there and said, hey, fellas, how y'all doing? I used to work here 35 years ago as a teenager, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to work for free. See, that's right, not. <laughs> if you go back and sin when you've been free from it, you're serving the wrong master. You're giving him free work. What then shall Paul, listen, here somebody says, well, Brother Jerry, I've been freed from sin. Sin has no hold on me. Jesus paid the penalty for my sin. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to sin because I'm forgiven. Well, you know, as Baptists, we're accused of that. And, and let me just look right into the camera. Bible doesn't say that, and Baptists don't believe that. Listen to me. Romans 6, 15, what shall we say then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? See, Paul could hear that in the back of his mind. And he knew there were some folks out there who going to say, Oh, <laughs> since you're forgiven, past, present, future, we can just live like we want to. No, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey them as slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and become slaves to righteousness. To God be the glory. Can this be? How can I be free from sin? Because of the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ when he said, te tell less die. Romans 8, 3 and 4. Listen, for what the law was powerless to do in that the, it was the weakness of the sinful nature. You see, my sinful nature was weak. It could not keep the law. God did by sending his own son substitution in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering 
He became a sin offering for you and for me. He's my substitute. And therefore, I am free from sin. And so he condemns sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. Substitution. Did you know that, right, you said, Brother Jerry, you just don't know me very well. Uh, I, I have a lot of problems. I have a lot of sin in my life. I have some bad habits and blah, blah, blah. And let me tell you something. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, when the Lord looks at you, he sees the righteous requirements of the law met in Christ in you. Now, I should, somebody should have said amen right there, unless y'all don't like forgiveness. Listen to this, Romans 8, 12. Listen. Brothers, we have an obligation. But it is not to the sinful nature. See, the text rhetorically cries out, if you don't have an obligation to the flesh, what do you have an obligation to? The Spirit. You see, and so now this is the way, look in verse 37. Mark says, you see what we've been doing, listen, since we started, when you, when you get saved and you start reading in the Bible, you notice one thing. From the beginning of Genesis all the way to this passage, we're making, we're making a beeline. We're, we're racing, racing to the cross. And Mark says that Jesus breathed his last. Matthew says that Jesus yielded up his spirit. Now, there's some things to note about this. One, you know, it's just nothing, I mean, it just, no big theological statements. The very simplicity of the scripture right here, I mean, it's just, it's absolutely so simple from the first words of Scripture, we're racing to get to this place. And, and Matthew tells us, and Jesus cried out in a loud voice, yielded up his spirit. Mark says, and Jesus cried out, breathed his last. Luke says, and Jesus cried out in a loud voice and said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. John says, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And here we have no big theological statements. We don't have a, a, a dissertation. All we have, we, we've come to this point just very simply, simply he says, in, in simplicity, he just, Jesus died. That was it. And it tells me this, that the spirit of Jesus went somewhere. John tells us he gave up the ghost, and he says, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. You see, we don't go to nirvana. There's no, no such thing as an, uh, annihilationism. We don't cease to exist Jesus was a spirit. He was a real person. John says, the re he says, John 10, 17, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life. I he says, nobody takes it from me. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up. What do we find out about Jesus? He gave up his life. When I tell you he willingly gave up his life, that's what I mean. The Romans didn't kill him. The Jews didn't kill him. Tetelestai, it is finished. He yielded up his spirit. The Bible says, Numa. He's a real man. You know, there's some theologies out there right now that talk about Jesus, that he actually just looked real. He wasn't a real person. He was just a, a ghost when he was here. He was some type of demiurge. He was some type of superhero from another planet. Can I tell you that he had blood running through his veins? He was made from a God-man flesh. He was a real person. He had a spirit. He was like you are and, and like I am. But he was the God-man. Look in verse 38. This is one of my favorite passages and one of my favorite words in the New Testament. We're going to finish right here. But. And then the Bible says, after Jesus just very simply said, it's finished, he gave up his spirit, and he died. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And then there were some people there that saw what had happened. The centurion... Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, Salome, Jose, 
The centurion even said, Surely this man was the Son of God. This image of the, in the temple, the word is naos for temple, and it speaks of the inner part of the sanctuary, the holy of holies. Now we know that temple was very special to the Jew, it was very special to the people, but you know it had a court of Gentiles, you, and the Gentiles could get in the court, but they couldn't go any further. Women weren't allowed to go but so far. There were certain Jews that weren't allowed to go but so far. And then there were some priests, they could go a little bit further. And then, and then there were some rulers and priests, they could go a little further. But there was one place that there was only one man who could go, that was the high priest, and he, he couldn't get in the Holy of Holies. And in there, in the Holy of Holies, there was a curtain. And that curtain, from uh, my research and what others have done, scholars tell us, there's a replica actually in Jerusalem today. It's 60 feet tall and 30 feet wide, and it's four inches thick. That curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. You know what that curtain said? That curtain said, you are unholy. You can't come in here. And some of you are so unholy, you're dogs. You're Gentiles. You can go in the court, but you can't come a little further. And the women didn't have any uh, standing in those days. And ladies, you can't come in here. And then there were some priests. They were allowed to get close enough to, to do some sacrifices for the people. And they could get a little bit closer. And, and then there was one man who had to offer sacrifices for his own self, his own sin for the people. And he could go a little further. And then, and then a high priest one time a year was allowed to go in there. And the Bible even tells us, and, other, and history tells us, they would tie a rope around the high priest's leg in case he died while he was in there. They had to drag him out because nobody else is allowed in there. I don't like signs. I don't like things that say no chipping, no fishing, no hunting. You can't park here. I like to go where I want to go. Went to Home Depot one day. I was parked wrong. They said, they said boy, women say, you can't park here. I said, I'm Jerry Gray. I can park where I want to. And I got out. Guy standing at the door said, sir, you can't park there. I said, okay, thank you. I turned around and went back and moved my truck. <laughs> y'all with me? Do, do y'all like it? Do y'all like it when you can't go places? When I go to the golf tournament and I stand on this side of the ropes and the players are over there, I want to get up close enough to see the action. I mean, I want to get into action. I stepped inside the ropes at the Augusta National one time, take a picture, try to get the crowd out of the picture. I felt a hand on my shoulder. Sir, if you put your foot on the other side of that rope again, we're going to have to ex escort you out of here. Yes, sir, I'm good. See, we all, we, nobody likes to be told you're not good enough. You can't come in here. You stay out there because you're not as good as the rest of these people. I have to tell you a story about Rick Offord and I went to a golf tournament one day. And we were walking along and there was these bathrooms over here. And we went into the bathroom. There was a young man there at the gate there and he didn't say anything. We went on in. There was a girl with him. Later I found out that was his girlfriend. And they were talking and carrying on. They weren't paying no attention to us. And we went in this little trailer that was a bathroom. We got inside and we realized we were in the player's bathroom. And Rick says, well, while we're here, <laughs> we just went. <laughs> and we went out, and I thought, that was real nice. Everybody else is going into porta potties. Y'all with me? That was a good day. That was funny. I don't like those things that tell me I can't come in. Y you see, this place was, was for the Jews. And Gentiles, they're godless. They don't have a God. They're hopeless. They don't have a, a religion. We were stateless. We didn't have a nation. You say, you say, people today say, well, you don't understand racism. Oh, yeah, I do too. There was a day and age as a Gentile, we were called dogs. You're not good enough to come in here. But when I read this passage, my heart is filled with joy. The, the Holy of Holies was this place that no one could get to. And, and verse 38 literally changes everything. It says that when Jesus gave up the ghost, it was torn from top to bottom. Now, do you know how the priest and the, uh, protected the Holy of Holies? There was a place in there. I tell you, if I'd have lived in that day, I'd have been one of those people. I'd have been stepping over the line. I'd been trying to look behind the curtain. I want to see what the ark looks like. I want to see what the high priest is doing in there. I want to get close to God. 
No, you can't get in there. And when Jesus died, he ripped it from top to bottom. And I've got just my little handkerchief right here, and I bet you I can fold it twice, and there ain't a man in the house that can tear it. I want to tell you it was an act of God. Four inches thick, and it was torn. It was ripped open. And God was saying through the Lord Jesus Christ, Come on in. Everybody come in. Everybody approach me. The New Testament speaks, this verse speaks of a new day. It speaks of a new life. It speaks of new access. It speaks of a new holiness. And more so than anything, it speaks of a new relationship with Jesus Christ. And with that curtain gone, what was it now? What, what, is, what is it now that stands between the sinfulness of man and the holiness of God? I just get this picture in my mind of what the priests were doing when the Holy of Holies was exposed and that curtain fell. They were probably running trying to cover it up. Oh no, oh no, we're all going to die. God's going to punish us. I can't imagine. And what does the Scripture say? Listen, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. Listen to this. Therefore, brothers, <laughs> since we have confidence confidence I've got confidence now I don't even have to be afraid to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way listen here's the here it is opened for us through the curtain the curtain has been opened that is his body the the old curtain has been replaced with a new curtain Listen, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. What is it that stands in between the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man? It is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, this curtain is open for you. Y'all all right? And since we have a great high priest, Christ, over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart full of assurance and faith. I can come to him. Look at this. Lord Jesus, Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for this message, for this word that tells me because of the substitutionary atonement of Christ, I but need to speak your name, and I am in the Holy of Holies behind the curtain, and I got there through the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they wanted to see a miracle. Oh, you show us a miracle and we'll believe. If that's not good enough for you, you will spend eternity separated from God. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you today because you have given us access. You have opened the way up, Lord. The path that has been paved and made is bigger than the valley in the Grand Canyon. It is so open and it is so free. You've accomplished everything for us. Lord, you have <laughs> defeated our greatest enemies. We have no fear of death. And though, Lord, we do sin, we do know that our sin is forgiven and that Jesus has paid the penalty for that sin even before I commit those sins. But by the obligation of the Holy Spirit, we do our very best to honor you and to live holy and righteous lives. Lord, we can just only today bow in reverence and thanksgiving for all that you have done for us. May you get glory and honor. Lord, may there be any one person in this room or any who listen by way of the internet, if they have not come to a place where they feel like 
they can receive Christ. Lord, may they see vividly today, vividly, that the door is open, the curtain is open, the curtain is gone, that Jesus stands in between them and a holy God. He said he was the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through Jesus Christ. Lord, bless this word. I've done the very best I can. Would you save the souls of men? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? Would you sing with your whole heart like Jesus has died for your sins? Pastor's here for you if you want to come. All to Jesus I surrender all to Him. that hymn make us fibbers when you say Lord I surrender all that's serious business let's give it all up to him amen all right you can be seated as we prepare for our offertory and uh, Tony's coming to pray for us and Tony if you pray for leaving a legacy as well and uh, during this time when you come to leave your offering you can give to uh, leaving a legacy as well and so pastor's gonna get us started off amen pray for us buddy Good morning. Uh, let us pray. Oh, Lord, Heavenly Father, Father God, we just thank you so much for this church. And I'm not just talking about the building, our church family, the people that make up this body. Father God, we thank you for Brother Jerry and the staff and the words that Jerry has conveyed to us, the, the breaking down of your word to help us understand and to draw closer to you. We thank you for him being so dedicated and everyone else that's here. Father God, right now we just pray for the offering and for our building fund. Father, we thank you for the opportunities that we have to be able to work and to be able to give back what we have earned to you to show our loyalty and love. Father, we ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Amen. Let's stand and sing for God so loved. For God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. The power of love forever defeated. Now it is well. I'm walking in freedom. For God so loved. God so loved the world. Amen. Have a great afternoon. You are dismissed.